Oh. <laughs> Unmute. Hello. Okay. Start video. <laughs> there we go. Hey. John. hey. Hello. Hey, hi. Hey, John. Hey, all. Hi, John. Well, hello, whoever. I just, I just, I knocked my mute back. <laughs> I guess I'll mute. Yeah. I, we don't have a picture. <laughs> we don't. Oh. Oh, yeah. well, that's okay, actually. <laughs> you have to move in so you can see that. Maybe that oh, these people. Hey, we're here. We're admitting everyone in here and uh, we'll get started. Let's see. That's so funny, the red red bat. I saw that at first. That was a funny one to see. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> but you're not. But that's a funny thing what you you just you just nickname yourself. Yes. Oh, there's Marley in. You can't. Hi. Can Who's you saying that? You just, we just have a black face. Hey, that's nice. <laughs> John is gone. Okay. Well, I think we have everyone in here. Um, first off, they're up in the right hand corner of your Zoom screen. There's something that says gallery view or speaker view. And um, if you toggle those, you'll have one with all the boxes and then you'll have another with just the speaker, which would be me right now being the largest image. So if you wanna flip over, so there's one um, large window for the speaker that will help your experience today. And then I'm gonna ask that um, here when John gets started that we, um, everybody mute their mic and um, just so we don't have any audio distractions while he's reading. And then we can, we can open that back up again once he's done. But um, uh, my name is Kristen Summers and I am the owner of Red Bat Books. And um, I welcome all of you today. Thank you for coming to this afternoon with John Morrison as he reads from his new book of poetry called Monkey Island. Um, I'm honored to have published this book as part of our Pacific Northwest Writers series. And uh, I do have a copy of the book here, so it is a real thing. <laughs> um, I know some of you have, have uh, placed an order and we really appreciate that and you should have that in your mailbox, hopefully very soon, so. Um, let's see. Sorry, looking at my notes here. Um, I think that's it. If you, if you have any questions, we're going to have a Q&A towards the end. And um, since we have all of our mics off, if you want to add some questions to the chat, um, if there are problems, we'll certainly answer them, you know, during the reading. But as far as questions for John, if you just add them to the chat, then we can sort of go through those at the end and he can hopefully have some answers for you. Um, <laughs> and uh, now I'm going to hand you over to our editor, Greg Johnson, and he'll tell you a little bit more about John and um, get things started. Greg? <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. You're welcome. It, it, it seems a bit odd, doesn't it? Int introducing someone you've never met. Uh, unless they're dead, of course. I, I introduce my students to old dead people all the time. But to be tasked with the introduction uh, to his family and friends, no less, of a man with whom you've never occupied more than a Zoom room, uh, never shared more than a virtual beer, well, that just seems a bit odd to me. On the other hand, uh, I have, in fact, uh, luxuriated in the language of our honored guest. I've marveled in his metaphors. I've relished his refraction of lived experience toward a poetic truth. 
Uh, and isn't that more important than mere proximity? <laughs> Such are the half truths I tell myself in this time of pandemic anyway. Uh, John Morrison earned his MFA from the University of Alabama and has been published in Rhino, the Cimarron Review, Poetry Northwest, the Seattle Review, and a number of other uh, prestigious poetry journals. Uh, John received the C. Hamilton Bailey Fellowship from Literary Arts, uh, won the Ray and Seymour Gorseline Poetry Competition with his 2007 book, The Heaven of the Moment, excuse me. Uh, he's both poet and educator of poets, having taught at the University of Alabama, uh, WSU Vancouver, and the Attic Institute. Uh, also, to uh, disam disambiguate for a moment, uh, there is a John Morrison who used to wrestle for WWE and fancies himself a poet. Uh, our, our John is a poorer wrestler, today at least, uh, but a finer poet. Uh, I, I hear my own youth in so many lines of John's, uh, particularly this one, a tangle without a moment's hush to hear the crows. And I can't think of a better description of the poet's art. Uh, Thank you all for being here. I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. John Morrison. Hey, Greg, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, that was kind, that was kind. Um, you all should know that uh, the, the original wrestler John Morrison was my father, or is my father, who was the, um, 1942 state wrestling champion of of Oregon. So uh, Johnny Morrison, John Morrison, who you referenced, Greg is he's still active. I think he still goes by Johnny Nitro. So or Johnny Mundo. My son's no. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you. It is um, uh, it is an, it is an honor for sure, and I want to begin with, I want to begin with some thanks to, to Kristen and Greg for the faith they put in my, my work. Um, I know that we'd all rather be at Jackie's art studio drinking wine and eating cheese. And, and I know Don Colburn brought beer by my house today and I, I kind of hope he brought it to everybody's house so we can all have that. Um, I owe a lot of folks for, um, for this book. Kristen Gregg, uh, uh, Dave Drecke has been with me for a long time through this. Sarah Gast has, has been an enormous help. And the book is dedicated to um, Peter Sears, who was uh, a very important teacher to me and an even more important friend. Um, anyway, I, I also owe our good friend, Miro Merrill for taking us to Monkey Island. She made it to Monkey Island. Um, saw this for us. And now it's on the cover of the book. Um, before I get, before I read, I'm going to read eight poems. Um, the Monkey Island poem has I think seven sections and I'll, I'll point those out to you. I'm not gonna read for a long time, but still it's important to, um, I'd like to begin with um, let just a land acknowledgement that we, here we are, I'm in Portland, Oregon, um, an incredibly rich, um, diverse land that fed the Chinook, Kayapuyans, um, for millennium, for a uh, time immemorial. And I don't know that anybody ever went hungry <laughs> during the time of, of um, the native peoples. And Portland to this day is still home to over 380 recognized native tribes and um, has the ninth largest urban native population in the country. So, um, and, and it's the, the 
the native art and native work going on right now is some of the most important going anyway. So friends, I'll go ahead and I'll start reading some poems. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's also, we should say happy birthday to Fiona. It's her birthday and um, she got a trip to Monkey Island. Um, the, I'll, get, I'll just get going. This poem is called My Father the Gorilla. My own father didn't know what to do with me. His hairy arms held him close, held me close to hairy chest, and I looked up into his soft, troubled eyes. The church and science told him, you can't have a human child, but he cared more for me than dogma. He chased my cousins and me around the yard with a rolling knuckle running gait, whooping and tipping over baby hippos and stuttering, you bad monkeys, you bad monkeys, you bad. We use pith helmets as bowls for coconut milk and explorer knives to scratch our butts and cut ourselves free from the webs of giant spiders. And for our whole time together, we love the trees and the breeze at night. We climb into high hammocks we braided from python skins, sway and hum until we fell asleep. Then at 20, I needed more than bananas and grubs, crouching in the rain with only a leaf for a hat and always being wary of poachers and missionaries. I met my mate on the path by the blue giraffes. She brought me a pair of trousers and led me away to have our own children who grow more human with every tomato. No word in gorilla says forever. So my father and I slapped each other goodbye. A dad once asked me, what, what are you up to? And I said, well, I've been doing some writing, dad. He goes, what are you writing about? And I go, well, you being a gorilla. So that taught him to ask me those questions. Um, a few years back, Mike, Tim, and I took a trip through Tennessee and Kentucky, and one thing we noticed was, this is true everywhere, um, there's a lot of junk around, um, and so we, we put together a plan. My brothers and I are coming back with a whirly bird to salvage all the tractors seized and left to rust in the wheat. The tractors that muscled the farmer one more furrow and no farther. Sure, he unbuckled the hood and checked for spark, primed the tinny carburetor again and again, cursed and walked for a wrench across the turned dirt, gave up on the goddamn and thin mood line. We're coming back for all the machinery out to pasture and melting down scrap to pour a new spine for our national renaissance. We have to wear earplugs and hard hats. One brother will pilot, hold the giant copter steady against gusty winds as the other two rappel down bulky chains, secure the Hulk, a dot in the Harkland with heavy hooks. And then we whisk our prize away across the sky to the giant cauldron, smoky red as a demon eye. We move west after Midwest, haul off junker cars tipped in arroyos, flimsy forgotten mobile homes that stink of ammonia and mold, all dropped into the molten royal, then the giant odd jacks of failed public art and the giant burnished silver, silver O's. I just realized how much trouble I'm going to get into with all the artists in this Zoom room for saying what I did about public art there. If it's any help, I would never write that last stanza today. Um, a few years ago, uh, Annette and I met in Sacramento and we drove to um, Mr. Julian's funeral. Um, and Annette and I have two bad habits. We don't wash our hair and we like beer for breakfast. And we took, um, we took the back roads. To our, old, or to our old home. Last fall, on our way to a funeral, 
My sister Annette and I traveled in her little blue car on back roads through the small towns that harvest wind off the delta with an army of splay-handed giants. The morning was calm and we tooled through before the windmills woke to sweep their arms to spin a single amp. The eucalyptus, which must the air with portents, hadn't so much as twitched their long gray leaves. The houses, Victorian farmhouses, slept in silent as a grudge. In the stillness, we felt the somber pull of the service ahead. I needed a new site, a long crisp track into the mountains and a railroad to run like a model train past the giant's feet with a cheery clickety clack and passengers with bright faces to wave from the windows and assure me my time had yet to come. So, um, Uh, when I, I think I was six, dad um, was in Mactan, uh, the Philippines, which was uh, certainly a big mystery to me and Margaret being the youngest. Um, and, and I remember on the radio or TV hearing about the Vietnam War and guerrilla fighters. And I, I, I think I harbored a secret fear of of gorillas for that reason. Um, because who, who wins a war against gorillas? That's just, that's like just even bad luck to fight gorillas. Um, and then interestingly, when dad came back, he, he, uh, he would, he would chase us around like a gorilla and call himself the big among them. But some of that fits into this next poem, which if it had a title, it would be called the family dog. For a full year, our father lived away on an island and flew planes heavy with missiles and gold and on weekends would golf with gorillas. At home, our mother was lost in the pantry or the laundry, the attic or behind the water heater where she'd opened the electrical panel with a trouble light and butter knife and tinkered with the base circuitry of our home. Summer, my older brothers found a shaded bank along Wild Horse Creek where they could, where they and their 16 year old friends could drink beer and slug each other. My oldest sister neglected her hair and washed the dishes. My next sister read historical novels in her room for nine straight days, slept for three and went back to reading. My little sister sucked a pebble and kept asking, where's dad? I'd say, sis, the plane, the missiles, the gold, the golf, the gorillas, remember? Then the lights would flicker out and from deep in the house, we'd hear mother curse, damn. They'd flicker back on and the big fan in the living room, a monster my size by the name of Arctic Breeze with a blade like my father's propeller would wind up to a deep resonant whir and spit a subtle rose water from a reservoir our mother filled each morning with a potion of crushed red and yellow velvet petals. I was the family dog, sniffing the trail by the creek, sniffing the steps to the basement, the threshold of my sister's room, the clean plates in the dish drainer, the family dog, unless I was a boy answering my sister, gold, golf, remember, missiles, gorillas, or lying on the living room floor, deep in the fragrance, or wrenching the rabbit ears right on the TV to scare away the ghost stalking Daniel Boone and his Cherokee blood brother, the fey yet lethal Mingo, a TV I would now and then hug. Oh, I think I'm getting into a lot of trouble with these poems. Um, okay, so this is, this is Monkey Island. Um, I, I wrote, a, wrote a poem called The King of Monkey Island, and that's where Dave Drecke thinks he named the manuscript, Monkey Island. Um, I, and and I, I lived with the title of this manuscript so long, these poems actually started taking shape. Um, so there's, like I said, seven sections, and I'll just sort of signal you when I'm going to go to a new one. Cleaning up junk left over from the making of the universe, the first monkey dropped a meteor, 
seared all the surrounding trees. Now the monkeys press their hand and footprints into the still steaming metal to mark their moment in the creamy gleam. Monkeys always argue their favorite color. Midday, the sky just above the boulder, the translucent ear of a newborn, what dolphins breathe, inside an oyster shell, the cave mouth, lava at night, fresh coconut meat, palm of the great mother after she rubs her chin, her chin. For the winter solstice, the monkeys trail long strands of tinsel one more night. They ache the next day and sleep on the beach. The children bury them in sand up to their faces and the faces become a long path of stepping stones. To escape the thieves who came one night, all the monkeys climb down and hide inside coconuts for 61 years. When a storm tossed a giant spotlight up onto the beach to wedge in the V between two palm trees, half the monkeys wanted to gut the metal for decorations and turn the large drum into a toy. They kept the spotlight whole for their plays. Always a scuffle and the monkeys bite to be on the stage crew. Spotlight the villain. Spotlight the couple kissing in the wings. Spotlight the magic stone in the hand. Stay with the stone. In the red wind, even old monkeys are scared when flying fish pelt the island. The typhoon leaves behind golden glass floats in the lagoon, a cave open where there was no cave, and a deflated silk balloon drapes the, chi drapes the trees like the slinking negligee of a giantess. Last one. One sunset, every monkey took a turn inside the pillar of flame and every monkey ached to share the light with loved monkeys no longer alive. Each thought, I want to hug the missing monkey who already gave their body to the river. Um, a few more. Um, I Recently I've started writing poems I've enjoyed writing. Um, where it's kind of a game to see how far you can get from the title and the first line to the last line. How far can you travel or how far will the poem go? So if this had a title, it would be called The Last Step of the Plan. After the heist, we can drop by the gloomy little bakery, step into the soft aromas and pick up a dozen macaroons, pink sit on a stone bench outside the Museum of Natural History, count our loot into the high 300s, and I can ask how you feel whenever you see the skeleton of a woolly mammoth, the bones tea stained to a shiny rich mahogany. Puzzled, amused, empty? A woolly mammoth with a big bony dome crammed with all our smarts and kindness could be a first rate friend once we run her through the car wash a few times. Close your eyes, little sister, close your eyes. We'd never be cold at night. The whole family wound in the deep pile of her pelt, asleep in the oceanic swells of her husky breathing and dreaming austere tundra dreams. Gentle with any talk of extinction, no one takes the topic well. When we can't keep enough cereal in the house, can't make nearly enough popcorn balls for snacks, we'll lead her by trunk to the breadth of the Zumwalt Prairie, the vast grassland, into the quiet contemplation and sear winds. She'll browse and amble and fit in out there, eyed from the distance by wolves, just like at home in prehistory. Um, Two more. Um, where we grew up, it was windy a lot. Days of wind. Our first house was carved into a wall of wind. The world was wind. 
inside we were wind. The whoosh of blood, the whoosh of red wind, regular and unforeseen. Our nerves belonged to the wind. You hid like a mole in a tunnel or stayed stubborn to roughen in the wind. At night we slept in the wind and the scent now of distant animals, now a forest to the north, and now the ocean stings our lips. The wind flowed like light through the fingers of a God who didn't always believe in kindness, touched our ears, slapped with an open hand. And here's the last poem that could be about Kim. And I should, I should also ask, add that, um, that I'm clumsy. So my, it was never wrong for dad or my cousin, John Kurtz, when I worked for him a summer to be afraid of me around sharp objects and power tools. The last wild stretch of Hurricane Creek runs back behind the barn where my uncle and I gloved and muddy grip, brace and yank out briar by roots for pasture. I am proud and grateful he has chosen me for labor and conversation. Unlike my father, he isn't afraid I'll gash myself with a sickle or stumble and stab him backside. I know all I think in the all I think doesn't matter in the world, but I hum along anyway between grunts, my muscles flush and steady, as my mind defies the chore and starts upstream to meet you on the trails down in the gray and heavy humidity that means brief showers of big drops to chase other hikers away from the pool tucked at a turn in the hills. We strip and slip pale into the cool green water we share with a pair of floating turtles and find each other for a long kiss. Thank you. Huzzah! Hey. Um, no, I'm I'm thinking you guys are smart enough not to ask any questions. <laughs> and you know that's that's right. That's great. You know, but, I don't have a question, but I just that I still can't get that image out of my head of of the kids burying the adults in the sand with the heads being stepping stones along the way. I just, that caught me for some reason today. I'm not sure why, but bravo. Well, you're certainly someone who belongs on Monkey Island, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I do. <laughs> Johnny, this yeah. is Wags. I, uh, Met you uh, 36 years ago, uh, late August in Tuscaloosa. But who's counting, John? <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, you and I stood in awe of a poem by uh, Kismet called, uh, Hismet called uh, Things I Didn't Know I Loved. Remember that poem? Yeah. And we used to read that out loud to each other. And uh, I, hear, I hear his voice and yours and your voice and in, in his this many years later. Um, and then I also hear the, the arc of your voice because a, a lot of the poems you read tonight actually remind me of like Berryman's late dream songs, you know, uh, uh, and they're more angular, more harder stops, um, less narrative, more imagistic. But uh, I just really enjoyed the poem that good for you. So you just said my poems are better than Berryman's? Wags, yes. I can't be saying that stuff. <laughs> you can't be saying that. On par, on par at the least, Johnny. I really enjoyed <laughs> them. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, do you think, um, well, if you all are good, I want to, um, I want to thank everybody so much for coming. It's really, it is, I appreciate what Greg said about, about, uh, the plague we're in and the plague we're going to get out of. Um, but it's also true. We couldn't, there's no way Jackie would let all of us into her art studio 
at one time and with all that wine and she'd be <laughs> afraid of her art. She would, and she'd be right too. So um, if, if y'all are good. I'm I have good. a question, John. Oh yeah, Kent, what do you got? It just, um, you, you know, your subject matter covers such a broad time span, it seems. And I just wonder how long you ponder some of these ideas before they formulate into something that you want to write down. Um, um, the trick question, John. Yeah, I don't know. The answer is, <laughs> the answer is I don't know. Do some the is, Okay. You got to, um, I've been writing this book for a long time, Ken. That's a good um, answer. How long? Since the last one. Wow. Yeah. So there's some that are that old. Some are some are like a year old. Um, it's it's. I have been I've been better at spending longer time on poems. Um, I think that that is a learning how to revise and stay in the poem and not rush it out the door and and want to just make it finished is. Um, I, it it doesn't work for everybody, but um, I found ways to stay in the poem kind of revising it, looking at it different ways, uh, taking some longer poems and just making, taking a poem that's 30 lines long and making it seven, taking a poem that's seven lines long and making it 32. I, it's yeah. because, because the fun is in the making. And, um, and I'm not the only one in this Zoom room, uh, poet wise, who, who realize they, they almost enjoy revising too much and they should, they should get some more work done. Uh, but some of those poems came very quickly. A lot of those poems came very quickly. Um, but I need to get you out of here because um, the monkeys are going to take over the island. And, uh, and can, we, can we order a book on this event or do we, can we do that some other way? Um, Kristen, can you drop the link in the chat? Yes, so the link is in the chat um, at the very top. Okay. It, um, the website is redbatbooks.com slash monkey hyphen island. But the link is up there at the top. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm not seeing it, Kristen, but maybe I don't have that for some reason. Um, okay. Um, there was one other question, John, uh, yeah. that I don't, I'm not sure if we, uh, if, uh, we had a, you had a chance to address. I'm not sure exactly who this is, but from Citizen Dave, uh, Lazaday has a question about the titles. And so whoever, whoever sent that question in, you might want to unmute and yeah, this is uh, this is Citizen Dave and Laz Day and Courtney. Uh, John, could you talk a little bit because you know it came up during the reading because you kept referencing the titles that had been. Um, what became of the titles, and could you talk a little bit about your choice to eliminate them? Um, this is going to give me trouble, Dave, because you know I, I often teach. Uh, well, I don't often. I have taught classes called titles, first lines, last lines. Um, and it's just, tr it's just the truth that after, I, I actually think that once you get into a book, um, so many titles are first lines anyway. Um, or sometimes titles are important in journals or when you're sharing a poem, but they aren't, um, they're all, if, if it's a good title, it's already sort of embedded in the poem. Um, so, and, and I'd been working on this manuscript so long, I was just, those titles just started boring me. <laughs> <laughs> Not that title again. Yeah. So, so that's why it seemed, it seemed natural to do. Um, it, it allowed me to see the poems fresh again and, and, and put them in, okay. in these different sections of the book and, and, um, in what felt like a very satisfying way to me instead of still sticking them um, with like titles or like moments. So thank you for that question, Lazaday. That was that was an insightful, that was a 
that was an insightful artistic question, Lassiday. That's and that's what I expect from you. May may we ask a follow up? Yes, Citizen Dave. <laughs> what uh, do you have plans for those titles now that they are out there floating around in the universe <laughs> for new poems? You're you're welcome to them, Dave. Okay, that's that's really what I'm asking. <laughs> Um, okay, well, um, Kristen, Greg, we close up shop. I have just one more thing to say. And that is, um, as you all, as you all go back to your lives, go be, go be better monkeys, okay? <laughs>